my current project is to actually develop a vaccine that will enable us to utilize the patient's own immune system to target those proteins rather than delivering an antibody. We can really rely on their immune system to do most of the work. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Connecting ALS. I am one of your hosts, Mike Stevenson, coming to you from the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And on the other end of the line in North Carolina is my colleague and co-host, Jeremy Holden. Jeremy, it is August, and I, for one, uh, can't figure out where July went. Yeah, another summer going by far too quickly. We've had some nice weather here in North Carolina, so that's been nice, you know, giving people an opportunity to get outside and try to enjoy some sunlight, but, you know, certainly still still trying to be socially distant and enjoy summer to the best of our ability in the times that we're living in. We've got to make the most of what summer we have here in 2020, and I think we could all use uh, some additional sunshine and, and also just a, a boost to morale. And if our listeners like us are needing uh, that kind of mental energy boost as we start another month here in August, I think they'll really enjoy hearing from our guest this week. Dr. Lauren Labassonaire is a young scientist and researcher at the Random Lab at the University of Florida. And Jeremy found it really interesting to hear about how her current project is taking shape and where she sees the future of ALS heading. Yeah, a real hopeful message, I thought, from Lauren on the the state of affairs in research and, and that search for treatments and a cure. Lauren, of course, uh, one of the Milton Stefanowitz postdoctoral fellows, her work supported by the ALS Association through that program and really one of the ways to try and recruit really bright young researchers into the fight against ALS and I you know I think you know Lauren's connection being personal she kind of talked about what drew her into the world of ALS research at an early age mm -hmm. one of our goals with this podcast is to keep folks informed about the latest in ALS research and hear from up-and-coming researchers like Dr. Labassonaire so let's take a listen back to that conversation now. We are joined on the phone this morning by Dr. Lauren Labassonaire from the Random Lab at the University of Florida. Good morning, Lauren. Thanks for being with us today on Connecting ALS. Yeah, thanks for having me. We're so excited to talk to you. We're always looking forward to hearing from researchers like yourself about how the world of ALS research is progressing. And doctor, you are a Milton Safenowitz Postdoctoral Fellow, which is an ALS Association program that supports up and coming scientists in search of a cure. And of course, we want to get into all of your work at the lab there in Florida. But if you wouldn't mind, could you start by telling our listeners a little bit about how you ended up on this path as a neuroscientist and why exactly you chose ALS? Yeah, absolutely. I knew from a young age that I wanted to be a researcher. I definitely wanted to make medicines and help people. I never really wanted to be a doctor because I thought working with patients would be a lot of weight on my shoulders. But if I could do some of the behind the scenes work and you know maybe make the medications that would be delivered to the patients who are suffering from these illnesses, that would be a really rewarding career. So probably around the age of 11, I decided that would be you know my path. And then when I was 13, my grandfather was diagnosed with ALS. And he had a pretty short battle with the disease. He died within a year of his diagnosis. And just witnessing a neurodegenerative disease in real time was was really heart wrenching, especially mm -hmm. ALS, since there are no you know available therapeutics. I mean, there's there's a couple of therapies available, but they don't have a long term effect, as you are aware, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. it was really tough to witness. And after the age of 13, I just decided you know I didn't want to live in a world where ALS took more lives. And I wanted to do everything in my power to create therapies and help the patients suffering from this disease. So that's been my passion since then. And when I went to college, I studied engineering, but during the summers, I worked at UMass Medical School on an internship in an ALS lab to really start off my research career. And since then, I've been studying the disease and it's been really rewarding. We're still working on coming up with a cure or at least some more therapies, but mm -hmm. it's a really nice field to be in. Everybody's really cares a lot about advancing research and working hard to help these patients. So I'm very grateful for the opportunities being in this field. It's incredible. It's, a, it's such an inspiring story to hear the connection that you had and the willingness to 
to just decide I'm, I'm going to be part of this fight. I'm going to do something to try and help create a world without ALS. You talked about the development of therapies. What do you see in the world of research right now that that inspires hope and, and gives you a sense that we are moving forward toward therapeutic interventions that could be effective? There are a lot of clinical trials currently ongoing. They're you know, trying to take a stab at the disease in a lot of different avenues. So there's clinical trials using antisense oligotherapies. Our lab, the Laura Ranum's lab at the University of Florida, is currently performing a clinical trial using an approved FDA-approved diabetes drug called metformin to treat patients of C9, ALS, and FTD. And so there's a lot of different labs throughout the country and outside of the U.S. as well trying a lot of different avenues to treat ALS. And I think that's what's really rewarding about it is we're not just trying to, you know, target the protein or target the DNA. We're trying every route available. And there's a lot of really creative scientists currently trying to study the disease and come up with new avenues for treatment. So I'm very hopeful that we'll see a viable therapeutic come out in the near future. We do hear from scientists like yourself about this being a genuinely exciting time in ALS research. So it's nice to hear from you that, that you feel like we are pushing forward, that we are making progress. That's always encouraging. What can you tell us, doctor, specifically about the research project that you're working on that is being funded by the ALS Association? Yeah, absolutely. So I can't disclose too much information as it's still in its early stages, but one of the other postdocs in the lab that I'm currently in actually worked as a pharmaceutical company and found that an antibody treatment in C9 ALS FTD mice alleviated uh, many of the symptoms of disease, including paralysis. It extended survival of the animals, things like that. And so the type of ALS that I study, it's caused by a repeat expansion in the DNA. So many types of ALS are caused by single nucleotide polymorphisms where a single base pair switch occurs. This is actually a GGGGCC expansion that occurs in this gene. We're not really sure why patients with this type of ALS have so many of these GGGGCC expansions, but what happens in patients of C9 ALS FTD is they have this buildup and aggregation of these toxic proteins. And so the antibody treatment that my colleague studied actually helped to rid the cells of those toxic proteins. And so my current project is to actually develop a vaccine that will enable us to utilize the patient's own immune system to target those proteins rather than delivering an antibody. We can really rely on their immune system to do most of the work. That makes it a little bit safer, safer for the patient. It also requires fewer treatments. So it's kind of a longer lived treatment than something that you'd have to take orally. And so we're really excited because we're working with a great company right now to develop these vaccines and I'll be testing them in mice but we've got some wonderful preliminary data that demonstrates the mice do actually have an immune response to the vaccination. So we're very hopeful that we'll see the alleviation of some of these phenotypes in the mice and that we may be able to bring it to, to trials in the future. Doctor, you are someone who is very active in social media. And for individuals and families living with ALS, they often turn to social media as a way to connect with others in similar situations and share ideas, kind of commiserate over their journey. What have you seen on social media about some of the optimism and hope for urgency and progress in ALS research and, and what people are saying? So the ALS community is very active on social media. I particularly follow it on Twitter. And it's really great to see some of the patients and their family members speaking up and trying to not only spread the word and educate others about the disease, but to try to help and push therapies forward. I've worked with several patients who have either donated tissue or worked with our lab to donate personal funds to advance research. And I think that by having such an active patient community is really one thing that's so wonderful about the ALS field. These people are, you know, reminding us every single day why we do what we do, and they're helping to motivate us. But they're also playing a really pivotal role in advancing our research by speaking up and, and getting the word out. So it's really, it's amazing to see how outspoken some of these patients are, and also how, you know, motivating they can be by sharing their stories and 
you know, maybe they have difficulty, you know, moving this limb, but they were able to walk a couple miles on a treadmill today. And it's really, it's just, it's a beautiful thing to see and, and take part in. So it's, I think that's one thing that's really amazing about the ALS community is how active the patients are in it. Sure. Lauren, Mike mentioned earlier that you are a part of the ALS Association's Milton Sefenowitz Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, which, as he said, is intended to try and help invest in and promote young researchers. What would you say to someone who's maybe early in their career, wants to go into medical research? What would you say to try and maybe recruit them to this fight and have them think about ALS as a field of research that they should consider getting into? You know, studying ALS is really rewarding. At this point, it's it's quite difficult because there's so much that we still don't know about the disease, how it manifests, why it affects certain cells. There's still a lot of genetic mutations that we still haven't identified. So there's a lot that can be learned in the field right now, and we're currently at this stage where I think we're, we've got this rapid growth. There's a lot of great minds using creative strategies to try to study ALS, but it's also a really rewarding field in that it kind of interplays with a lot of other fields. So we see a lot of similarities between ALS and other protein aggregating diseases, such as Alzheimer's. We can also relate the, the types of ALS that I study, C9, to other repeat expansion diseases. So you can learn a lot about just neurodegenerative diseases or neurological diseases on the whole by studying ALS. But it's also just, like I mentioned, it's a really rewarding field because there are so many motivated and passionate researchers and getting to work with these patients is very rewarding. So I think it's a really nice field to work in and the community is just phenomenal. Thanks for drawing those connections, doctor. And we're so happy that there are bright minds like yourself up and coming in this field and are going to be the ones that push us forward and make those breakthroughs that are going to bring meaningful treatments to the disease. Before we let you go, we've been asking this question of most everyone we've spoken with in the past five months, but I'm always particularly interested in how research labs are managing during the pandemic. What sort of changes have been made to your lab environment so that you and your colleagues can keep moving forward with your critical work? It's been a really interesting year. So I'm in the random lab at UF and the University of Florida actually shut down for about 10 to 12 weeks and only essential researchers were allowed to go into lab. So our lab, we have about 12 to 15 people, was broken down to just three to four people who were allowed to actively go in and perform essential research. So I was actually working from home for a short while. Mm. And that was really tough because, of course, my bench research stopped. But it was a nice opportunity for us to get some papers out. And, you know, using these publications is our main way to communicate with other scientists. So that was, you know, kind of a nice opportunity to actually get those publications finished up. But now that we're back in lab, you know, we've just hit the ground running and picked up right where we left off, which is the nice thing about research that you can do that. Mm-hmm. But we're still practicing, you know, social distancing. So our lab, we're actually working on shifts. So rather than going in for, you know, however many hours a week, 40 to 60 hours, depending on what you do, I work the morning shift. So I'm there between 7 and 2 p.m. And then my colleagues will come in at 2 p.m. and, and leave around 7 or 8 p.m. So we have definitely cut back a little bit just to be safe. But we're back in lab and we're excited to be there and moving research forward again. And hopefully this will all subside soon so we can keep going even faster. <laughs> well, thank you again, Dr. Lauren Labossonair from the Random Lab at the University of Florida. It was really insightful to hear about uh, your important research and your outlook for the future in ALS. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great speaking with you both. Well, thank you again to Dr. Lauren Labassaner from the Random Lab at the University in Florida, sharing some of her insights on ALS research and where things are going, even during the pandemic, overcoming some of the challenges to continuing clinical research. And of course, her, her lab work continues to go forward. So thanks again to Dr. Labassaner for sharing some of her time with us this week. We often say after we talk to researchers that we want to hear from them down the road. We really do want updates on their progress. And Dr. Labassanera is one, I think, that's doing some really promising research on that C9 gene. And we will have to check back in with her down the road. Thanks to all of you for listening this week. You can subscribe to the show if you haven't already at connectingals.org or wherever else you listen to podcasts. 
and we encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. This week's episode was produced by Garrett Tiedemann of the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter of the ALS Association. Thanks once more for tuning in this week. We'll connect with you again soon. Thank you.